What's up, Hughes Youth? Thank you guys for tuning in with us tonight. Let me just say that I miss you guys so much. I know Pastor Chris does and all of our other Connect team members. We cannot wait till we can get back together where we can um, hang out, have a good time, just party and celebrate Jesus. But I am thankful for technology where we can interact still. Um, so this is the week where it's leading up to Easter, right? We all know that it's on our calendars. But Pastor Chris and I wanted to take a few moments tonight with you and just really point each of us and remind our hearts and our souls and even our minds what our true hope is, right? And that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why we can sing. That's why we can smile every single day because we have hope in Jesus. So before we get started, can we pray together before we worship and hear a word tonight? Father, thank you for loving somebody like me. I'm so undeserving of your love, of your friendship, of your mercy and your grace, but God, you give it continuously. May my life be a wonderful reflection of the hope that you have given each of us believers. God, we are thankful for the cross, but more importantly, we're thankful for the empty tomb where your body was not there. You rose from the grave. You conquered death like nobody else could. God, tonight, would you direct our attention to, to why we focus on Good Friday, to why we celebrate on Sunday on Easter. God, you are our hope, you are our rock, and we want to celebrate that tonight. We want to rejoice in you tonight. So God, may every heart sing with us. May every soul listen to your word tonight. God, may you be glorified in all that we say and do, and I say all this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's worship together.
So guys, go ahead and grab your Bible. I want you to turn with me to John chapter 12. We're going to flip to John chapter 12. We're going to get three verses tonight. John 12, 12, 13, and 14. So while you're getting your Bible, the week leading up to Good Friday, the city of Jerusalem, it's buzzing. There are hundreds of thousands of people that are gathering to celebrate the Passover feast. And Jesus is about to enter into the city of Jerusalem. And his entrance, it's a very dramatic one. Jesus is a marked man. The Pharisees have been looking for ways to kill Jesus for quite some time now. In John chapter 11, just a few verses before this passage we're going to look at tonight, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. And the news of Jesus raising Lazarus has many turning to Jesus and putting their faith in him. And so Jesus, his popularity, is at an all-time high. There are people that are coming for this Passover feast that are in attendance, and they're wondering if this Jesus that they've heard of is going to be there. And most of the people at that Passover feast had never had an experience with Jesus. Most of them had never even seen, spoken to, or had the privilege of touching Jesus. But I can't help but think that many of them there had experienced Jesus' healing. I mean, think about it. All of the passages of Scripture that talked about how Jesus healed a blind man, or he raised a lame man, or he caused um, the deaf to hear, or he cast out a demon and somebody was miraculously healed because of an interaction with Jesus. Can you imagine the reunion that they would hope that he was coming to Jerusalem so they would run to see if they could see this Jesus that had healed them? Or maybe maybe they hadn't been healed, but maybe it was somebody in their family. Maybe it was a family member. Maybe it was someone that was a, 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 a co-worker. Maybe it was someone from another village that was close by that had testified that this Jesus had healed them. And so Jesus had been doing his earthly ministry for three years now, and it was all leading up to this climactic point that we call Good Friday that we're fixing to celebrate in just a couple of short days. So look with me in John chapter 12. Let's look at three verses and see what scripture has to say tonight. This passage of scripture is actually labeled the triumphant entry. And verse 12 says this, the next day, The large crowd that had come to the feast, they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And so they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it just as it is written. So these people that were expecting Jesus, this huge crowd that had come out to see him, scripture says that they cried out, Hosanna. But in this day and time, the cry of Hosanna, it had become more of a greeting or a shout of praise. However, the Hebrew word for Hosanna actually means this. It means to save or to help. And so these people were crying out to Jesus because they had heard of the things that he had done before in the past. They had seen, many of them had seen the miracles that he had done. And so now they're crying out to this one, this Jesus who's entering into Jerusalem. The throngs of people are there to see him and they're literally crying out, save us, help us. But it's it's funny because these words were typically used to address a king with a specific need. You see, the people that would cry out Hosanna to Jesus, they wouldn't normally cry out Hosanna to their spouse. They wouldn't cry out Hosanna to their children. They wouldn't cry out Hosanna to any of their family members, not even a coworker, not even a boss. They would only cry out. This was a term that was reserved to cry out to a king because a king had the ability and the capability of actually helping to save a person of actually helping them in their need. And so there literally, there's this weird dynamic 
They're saying, save us, help us. But then look what else they did. We see that the people were carrying palm branches. You see, this was symbolic of a victorious king. Many times when a king would go out to battle with his armies and when they would be victorious as they came back into town, it was not uncommon for people to grab a, a palm branch and they would wave it in celebratory fashion as the, as the king returned from battle. I'm sure David would have seen this. And so we have this, this, this celebratory thing where people are carrying palm branches. Can you picture it? Jesus is entering this city of Jerusalem. And people are not only yelling out, save us, help us, but people are also celebrating for a victorious king. So you have two sides of the spectrum. You have, one, you have people that are saying, help us, save us. But then you also have people that are crying out, victorious king. The people go on to say this. I love this. It says, blessed is the king of Israel. Now the people are actually dubbing Jesus the king. But the people saw Jesus as the one who was going to come and to rule here on earth. You see, the people thought Jesus was going to liberate Israel. They thought he was coming to establish peace. They thought he was coming to subdue the Gentiles. And so with this mindset, it only makes sense that someone of this caliber, someone who their, their plan was to come and to set up a kingdom here on earth, they would arrive in the city of Jerusalem on, on a horse, something that symbolized power or maybe some other symbol of power, a chariot perhaps. But look at what Jesus did. Jesus' whole life, we know that Jesus is the King of King and the Lord of Lords, but when Jesus was born on the earth, how did he come? Did he come in majesty? Did he come with trumpets blowing? Did he come and, and be born in a palace? No. He was born of the lowliest of low. He was born in a manger. And so Jesus, instead of riding in to Jerusalem on some regal animal, look at what he says. He, he, he instructs his disciples to bring him a colt. That's a young donkey. Jesus says, when I ride into Jerusalem, I don't want to ride on a horse. I want to ride on a donkey. And it's funny because Jesus is literally making a mess of the picture that these people were trying to paint. You see, oftentimes I think it, that we're very similar. God is always up to doing something, right? But it's kind of like this paintbrush. God is trying to paint a picture even as the things that we struggle with now with this coronavirus. Do you know that God is trying to use this to paint a picture? And oftentimes what we do is we try to snatch the paintbrush from God's hand and we start to paint the picture that we want to see. The fact that Jesus said, go get me a donkey, it's literally like he took his hand and messed up their painting or messed up their idea of what they wanted to happen. The narrative of this particular story, God's word, it wasn't to be decided by the people. It's not our job to figure out the narrative of what God's word says. On the contrary, the narrative of this story, the one we're discussing, the narrative of the Bible, the narrative of this story, the narrative of your story, it's all God's story. It's God's narrative. And I believe that oftentimes, we miss what it is that God's doing, what it is that God's trying to do, because we lose sight that everything that exists is a part of his story. You know, this coronavirus, it's not a part of our story. Even though it's affecting us, this is a part of his story. It's a part of God's story. It's a part of his narrative. God is in control. And I just want to challenge us, challenge you and I today, that as we lead up, I don't want to focus on the coronavirus. We need to be focusing on the Christ that's riding into Jerusalem that we're reading about here. The crowd shouted, help us, save us. And it's ironic that that's exactly what Jesus had come 
to do. But Jesus wasn't going to save them. It wouldn't be through political liberation that they expected. That's what they wanted. They had always had a king. And that's what they were looking for, someone to sit on a throne and to rule them. But Jesus was here to do the will of God the Father. You see, God's narrative never changes. God is painting a picture, and it's spelled out in his word. The people thought that Jesus was going to come there to, to liberate them politically, to rule them, and to set up a kingdom here on earth. But can I tell you tonight, student, Jesus never came to fix a broken system. We need to hear that. Jesus never came to fix a broken system. He came to fix a broken relationship. Each and every one of us, everyone in this world has sinned. And scripture says, for the wages of sin is death. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The glory of the one who's painting the picture. It's his narrative. It's his story. And so we need to realize that it's not, Jesus never came to fix a broken system. He came to fix a broken relationship. The relationship that you and I broke when we sinned against a holy God. So as we close tonight, as we celebrate Ash Wednesday, and we look forward to Friday, Good Friday that's coming up, the, the climax of the purpose of Jesus to come to this earth. We see in John 3, 16, for God so loved this world that he gave. He gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I don't know what your situation is tonight. I don't know where you're at tonight. I don't know what it is that you're going through or that you're dealing with tonight, but can I tell you, God does. And if you're in a broken spot, whether it's emotionally, physically, financially, spiritually, guess what? Jesus came not to fix broken systems, but he came to fix a broken relationship. And God wants to have a relationship with you, but it only comes through Jesus Christ, his son. Would you guys pray with me? Father, right now, I pray that as those who are watching tonight, if their hearts are hurting, Lord, Scripture says that you are near to the broken hearted. Jesus, we lift them up before you tonight. If there be someone who's watching tonight and maybe their world is falling apart around them, God, you know, you know what it is that they're going through. And so, God, you want to fix their broken relationship, not the system, but the relationship. And we see that evident through your scripture in what Jesus did. Jesus came not to do his own will, but to do your will, because you are the author of this story. And so I pray, God, that over the next few weeks, especially as we lead up to Good Friday and Easter, God, I pray that you would help our minds and our hearts and our thoughts to be focused on you, that we would block out the craziness of this world. We all want somebody to fix the broken system with this virus. And God, maybe, just maybe, you're painting a bigger picture and we're so focused on one small thing and you're over here trying to get our attention. You're trying to point us back to your son, Jesus, because Jesus is the only way. In scripture, you've said, Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So tonight, Jesus, we ask for your Holy Spirit to minister to us. We pray that you would prepare our hearts. We pray that we would be repentant of our sin. And we look forward to this Friday where we remember the sacrifice that you paid that cost you everything so that we could have a broken relationship fixed between us, a sinful people, and your Father, a holy God. Thank you for these moments. We love you, Jesus, and we praise and worship you. In your name, amen.
Guys, that was an amazing word. I know my heart has been blessed tonight. I pray that yours has been too. Um, guys, we are in this place that we're getting ready to celebrate Easter on Sunday, but we're also in this mode of reflecting on what Good Friday really means. You know, Jesus died for you and me. He took on our cross. So this week, we're really taking time. We're really seeing the symbols, and we're really seeing the things that, that mean something to our faith. So we created this video to show you how you can make unleavened bread, just like Jesus did when, when he was with his disciples over Passover. So guys, watch this video, learn how to make it, make it for your own, make it for your family, and guys, celebrate Good Friday with us, and then have a celebration with us on Sunday as we, as we celebrate and rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We love you guys. Watch this video.